Okay, so what? Well, this is the definition of a lattice. I'm going to use the same addition than Timo Oliver for denoting the supremum and the infimum of two elements. As Timo Oliver did, we are also going to consider just real vector lattices. So a vector lattice is just a vector space with a lattice structure such that the sum and the multiplication times by positive scalars behaves well with respect to the other. And well, this allows us to, to, to speak about positive elements in the vector lattice. We can define the positive part of, a, of an element, the negative part, the absolute value of an element. And we can also talk about disjoint elements in a vector lattice. So two elements are disjoint if the absolute values have infimum zero. And finally, a Banach lattice is just a vector lattice, that is a Banach space, and such that the norm behaves well with respect to the other in the sense that, well, we have any two elements X and Y such that the absolute value satisfies this inequality here, then the norms of X is more equal than the norm of Y. Okay, so as you may, well, the, the norm of any, of any element coincides with the norm of its absolute value. And well, almost every classical Banach space has a natural structure of a Banach lattice. Okay, spaces are natural examples of Banach lattices. Also, little lp, capital lp of mu. And well, in general, any Banach space with a one conditional basis has a natural structure of a Banach lattice. So, as you may know, Banach lattices are uh, quite natural examples of uh, Banach spaces. And well, let me motivate a little bit the talk with this piece of text from the introduction of the book of Saefer uh, of uh, Banach lattices and positive operators. After explaining the the beginning of vector lattices in the middle of 1930s and explaining that some very well-known mathematicians uh, contributed to this theory, like Chris, Kakutani, uh, Kantorovic, Stone. Then he wrote this. So he said that in the years following the early period, period functional analysis and vector lattice theory began drifting more and more apart. And well, he said, it is my impression that linear of the theory could not quite keep pace with the rapid development of general functional analysis and that developed into a theory that's existing for its own sake. So as you may see during this talk, uh, Banach space theory developed quite uh, much more faster than Banach lattice theory. And there are some theorems in some results in this Banach lattice theory, which looks, let's say, um, like classical, but that, that are quite recent. So I hope that those who are not still working on Banach lattice theory, finding this talk an invitation to start working in, in this field. So let me continue with the most important concept of this talk. If we are working in Banach space theory, we usually consider bounded linear operators. But if we are working in Banach lattice theory, we can also work with some other properties concerning the order. So, for example, we can assume that T preserves the order, which is just equivalent to saying that T sends positive elements to positive elements. And this is why another preserving operator is known as a positive operator. But the problem is that these operators might not preserve suprema and infima. So, uh, an example, this example is, is one if you take that operator from the real plane to the real line, which just sum the two coordinates, then this is of course positive, but it does not preserve suprema since T of the supremum of the two canonical vectors of the basis is just equal to one, and this is not the, is equal to two, and this is not the same that the supremum of the evaluations. So as Timur Oiber has done in his talk, it is more natural when dealing with a class of Banaclatis to consider the, as homomorphisms, what we call lattice homomorphisms. So we also assume that T does not only preserve the order, but also preserve suprema and infinite. <coughs> okay, so, well, in addition, this uh, operator is a Banach isomorphism, then we say that lattice, it, that it is a lattice isomorphism. And I'm using here a slightly, uh, a slight different notation by a lattice isomorphism, I mean just onto its image. Okay, so this might, this might not be subjective. Okay, so since we have different kinds of operators, we have 
different kinds of different ways of embedding a banach lattice into another banach lattice. So in general, banach space theory, we usually consider linearly embeddings. But if this embedding is also a lattice homomorphism, then we say that the banach lattice X is a lattice embeddable in two y. So we are going to deal with uh, linearly, linearly embeddings, with lattice embeddings, and we are going also to consider embeddings through positive operators. So let me tell you some uh, well-known results in the theory of Manac lattices, which relate the existence of a linear embedding with the existence of a lattice embedding. For example, this is a very well-known result from Lozanovsky, which characterized reflexive Manac lattices as those Manac lattices which does not contain subspaces isomorphic to little r1 or to c0. But this condition is also is in turn equivalent to the fact that it does not contain sublattices isomorphic to little r1 or to c0. So we can that the containing a subspace isomorphic to, lead, to little r1 or to c0 implies the existence of a lattice embedding of little r1 or t0 into x. So we can pass from the linear structure to the lattice structure. Yeah. Well, I tend to always be confused by this result. In point three, the isomorphism is a lattice isomorphism, right? Yeah. And in two, it's just a oh. just just as, as, a, as a spaces. Okay. okay. Thank just you. as Banach spaces. Yeah. So this is the, 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 the difference. In three, we are considering them as lattices, and in two, we are considering them as spaces. So the embeddings are just linear embeddings in the case of two, and in the case of three, they are lattice embeddings. Okay. okay. Thank you. And well, in particular, this implies that the uh, James space, which is a reflexive Banach space, a, a non reflexive Banach space, which does not contain neither one, neither C0, cannot be isomorphic to a Banach lattice. So the situation with Banach lattices is quite different. And well, we have also a very nice results from Major Nigel, which says that whenever we can embed C0 as a subspace, then we can embed it as a sublattice. Okay, so watching these two theorems, one may think that maybe the same holds for little l1, that is sign that we can embed it in a banal lattice, maybe we can embed it also as a, as a lattice, but this is not true. In particular, well, little l1 can be embedded into C of the unit interval, and it is not lattice embeddable into this space because if we take a disjoint sequence in a CK space, it is going to behave like C0. So it cannot behave like an L1 sequence. So this theorem of Meyer Niebeck does not hold for little L1. And we wonder what other Banach lattices satisfy serve the same property that C0. Okay, so the main question of the talk is whether there are other Banach lattices having the same property than C0. And well, there are some other nice results which also relate the, the linear structure with the lattice structure. For example, little l1 does not satisfy this property, but it somehow satisfies a similar property. It is lattice embeddable into a Banach lattice if and only if it is linearly embeddable as a complement of subspace in X. So a similar property appears in the talk of Timur Hoiberg corresponding to the free Banach lattice of of a Banach space E, and this was in turn equivalent to the fact that L1 was complemented in the, in the Banach space E. And well, this is in turn equivalent to several other conditions. This is due to Sarah Pelczynski. And well, indeed, the fact that uh, L infinity is linearly embeddable into the dual Banach lattice, even only if it is lattice embeddable, this is a consequence of the following more general theorem, which states. That for a sigma dedekin, for dedekin sigma complete banal lattice, these two facts are equivalent. So it's time that we can embed an infinity as a subspace. We can also embed it as a sub lattice. Okay. By a dedekin sigma complete, I mean a banal lattice where, where every non empty countable subset bolded above has a supreme. Okay. So let me go again to this question. This is the main question that we are going to consider in this talk. 
And well, if we just try to look for a separable Banach lattice satisfying this property, well, one may think, okay, why is a separable Banach lattice satisfying this property? Then since it is separable, it must be, it is linearly embeddable into C of the unit interval. So if it has this property, it must be essentially a sublattice of C of the unit interval. So it is natural to wonder whether C of the unit interval has this property. And this is what we prove. We prove that C of the unit interval is lattice embeddable into a Banach lattice if and only if it is generally embeddable into the Banach lattice. So I'm going to focus on this uh, theorem. I'm going to explain what are the main ingredients of the proof of this theorem. It uses several nice results of Banach lattice theory. In particular, the main motivation also for this theorem is this paper of Lotz and Rosenthal, where they study embedding different kinds of embeddings of C of the Cantor set and capital L1 into Banach lattices. So one of the main theorems of, the, of this paper is uh, are several equivalent conditions to having a positive embedding from C of the Cantor set into a Banach lattice. So they are written here. Let me use the, the same notation that have, I have already introduced. So if that allows the counter space, then they prove that for a Banach lattice X, it is equivalent that there exists a positive embedding of C of the counter set into X, that there exists a lattice embedding of capital L1 into the dual of X, and that there is a, such a lattice embedding, but now from the dual of C of the counter set. So notice here that they are already considering these different ways of embedding a Banach lattice into another. So in the point one, they are considering just positive embeddings, and in two and three, they are considering lattice embeddings, so embeddings through lattice homomorphisms. So at the very end of this paper, they ask whether the existence of a linear embedding of C of the Cantor set into a Banach lattice already, already implies the existence of a positive embedding. Okay, which is somehow something quite similar to what we are asking, but for just uh, positive embeddings and not lattice embeddings. And indeed, well, this question was answered by Gousseau five years later. So he proved that C of the Cantor set can be positively embedded into a Banach lattice whenever it is linearly embedded into this Banach lattice. So well, let me let me write this condition just as another equivalent condition in this theorem of Lotz and Rosenthal. And indeed, the theorem that we are going to prove, our theorem, can be also added as an, as an another equivalent condition of this theorem. Okay. So here we have positive embeddings, we have linear embeddings, we have lattice embeddings. And well, of course, uh, since C of the Cantor set can be positively embedded into C of the unit interval for implies five. Um, well, five is somehow a strengthening of four, okay? And indeed, one may think that uh, maybe there is a chance to, to, to put C of the Cantor set here instead of C of the unit interval in, in order to make this theorem, let's say, more elegant and to consider always the same space. But we cannot put there C of the Cantor set. Indeed, C of the Cantor set linearly embeds into C of the unit interval. In fact, they are isomorphic as Banach spaces, but it is not lattice isomorphic as to a, to a sub lattice of C of the unit interval. Okay, and well, this is a consequence of this fact. We can even characterize those CK spaces with arts which are lattice embeddable into C of the unit interval as those CK spaces. Where K is a disjoint union of piano compact, where a piano compact is just a continuous image of the unit interval. Okay, so this proposition is uh, proved in our paper. And well, let me say that this is this more, more or less easy to prove just using a very well known result, result which characterizes those lattice homomorphisms between Banach lattices. So whenever we have compact spaces K and L, then a lattice homomorphism from CK to CL must be of this form. 
So it must be induced by a, a continuous scalar function u and a function h of this form. So t is given by this formula here. So by using this fact, um, it is not very difficult to prove this proposition. And well, what is the next ingredient of the proof? Well, you may know that every separable Banach lattice, every, every separable Banach space embeds into C of the Cantor set, but we do know that not every separable Banach lattice is lattice embedded into this space. So in particular, little one cannot be lattice embedded into this space. So one may wonder if there is another Banach lattice, separable Banach lattice, which is, let me say, more or less as simple as this one, in which every any other separable Banach lattice can be embedded. And well, there is such a Banach lattice. This one satisfies this property. Every separable Banach lattice embeds lattice isometrically into C of the, the space of continuous functions from the Cantor set to capital L1. Okay. And well, the norm is this one. So, well, if I ask someone which is not a who is not an expert in Banach lattice theory um, to, to, to guess from what decade is this result, well, I guess that after watching the first part of the talk, we are talking about results from the 70s, the 60s, and the 80s from lots of Rosenthal, which looks somehow more complicated than this one. This is quite elegant, quite simple. I guess they would say maybe this decade, 60s, 70s, 80s, but indeed, this is a very recent result. We have some of the authors here in this room. And for me, it is quite amazing that such a simple, beautiful, elegant result. <laughs> <laughs> Not this one. It was too much. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, for me, it's amazing that this result was discovered just a few years ago. So, in particular, this confirmed that Banach lattice theory is still in an early stage of development. So, I really think that if you want to prove an elegant, simple result, you may try to prove it inside Banach lattice theory, because I guess there the, there might be some of the beautiful results what's, which are still waiting for you to, to be discovered. So, okay, this is one of the main ingredients of our talk. Indeed, we can take advantages. The, the advantage of taking any separable banner like this inside this banner like this. So here we have a setting, a nice setting where we can work with an explicit uh, form of the, of the elements of the banner lattice. So we, we will see later how do we take advantage of this representation? But let me let me continue with the last main ingredient of the proof, which is the following result of well, this is the just a definition, but the Bacter and Wigster considered the concept of projectivity. They said that the Banach lattice P is projective if whenever we have a Banach lattice X, a closed idea J, and we consider the quotient map Q, <coughs> then P is projective if whenever we have a lattice homomorphism from P to the quotient, then we can lift it to a lattice homomorphism from P to X, and in such a way that the norm of T is controlled by the norm, the, the norm of T hat is controlled by the norm of T times one plus epsilon. So they prove that C of the unit interval is projective. And well, a, a particular a consequence of this fact is that, well, if we, if we consider T as uh, a lattice embedding, then T hat must also be a lattice embedding. So in particular, as a consequence, we have that if C of the unit interval can be lattice embedded into a question of a Banach lattice X, then it can be lattice embedded into X itself. So these are the main ingredients of the proof. So let me try to, to, to give you the, the main ideas. So the starting point is just a 
linear embedding of C of the unit interval into X. And what we want to prove is we want to construct a lattice embedding of C of the unit interval into X. So first of all, since C of the unit interval is isomorphic to C of the Cantor set as Marek spaces, instead of considering this operator T, we are going to consider an embedding of C of the Cantor set into X. And by the previous result of Kosuf, this embedding can be supposed to be a positive embedding. And well, among these uh, equivalent conditions proved by Gons and Rosenthal, they prove that indeed, if we have such a positive embedding, this positive embedding can be taken in such a way that this norm is as close to one as we wish. So we are going to fix epsilon, and we are going to assume that the, the product of these terms is a smaller ripple than one plus epsilon. So, moreover, we can also assume that X is separable because C of the unit interval, C of the Gantor set, these are separable Banach lattices. So we can just consider the, the, the Banach lattice generated by the of, through these operators and just work in this uh, Banach lattice. So we can suppose that it is separable. And therefore, we can just think that X is a sublattice of this space here. So the space of continuous functions from the Cantor set to capital one. So what are we going to do? We are going to try to construct a sublattice of X with a quotient lattice isomorphic to C of the Cantor set. And once we have done this, since C of the unit interval can be a lattice embedded into C of the Cantor set, then by the previous result of the pattern and mix set, it is lattice embedded into set and therefore into X. What is what we want to prove? And why do we work with C of the Cantor set instead of C of the unit interval? Well, just because let's say it is a zero dimensional compact space, so it is easier to work with the Cantor set than to work with the unit interval. So if we identify the Cantor set with the sequences of zeros and ones, we consider the dyadic tree, just as all the partial functions that all finite sequences of zeros and one. Then we can consider each partial <coughs> function induces a, a cloping in the counter set. And we can consider for each cloping its characteristic function, which we denote as uh, F sigma. Okay, so these functions, F sigma, gives uh, a system of functions, of normalized functions, which are indexed in the direct in the dyadic tree, and we satisfy these conditions here. So it's F sigma is the sum of the two immediate successors of F sigma zero and F sigma one. And indeed, all the functions belonging to the same level are paired with this gem. So the point is that if we have a semi-normalized semi family of functions indexed in the dyadic tree, Having these two conditions here, that the, the sum of two gives the, the predecessor, and, the, and that every element in the same level uh, was disjoint, then the, the Banach lattice generated by such a family must be lattice isomorphic to the C of the Cantor set. So, what we, want, what we are going to try to do is to, to construct such a such a family of functions in a quotient of a sublattice of X. In particular, what happens also is that, well, if we consider just this space here, this YN, then the Banach lattice generated by these functions here coincides just with the Banach space generated by this function. So we don't have to, to take care of uh, distinguishing between the Banach lattice and the Banach space, because if we, if we have just finitely many disjoint functions, then the Banach space generated by these functions is already a Banach lattice. Okay? So in particular, by the stone bias theorem, the, the closest linear span of these spaces gives C of the Cantor set. And well, essentially, this is why we work with C of the Cantor set instead of C of the unit interval, because let's say that we have a nice representation of functions 
which are somehow split and which generate the, the whole space. We cannot construct such a family in C of the unit interval. Mm -hmm. So what we do is, okay, we're, mm, mm, our starting point was this positive embedding. So we consider G sigma, just the image through this embedding of the functions F sigma. So these functions, G sigma, already satisfy this condition. They satisfy also these conditions here. G sigma is the sum of G sigma zero plus G sigma one. And the point is that since this is a positive embedding, this is not a lattice embedding, it does not preserve uh, the infima. And therefore, these functions might not be pairwise disjoint when we look at the functions which belong to the same level of the dyadic tree. So our goal is to try to pass to a quotient where these functions are again disjoint, okay? So in order to do this, well, well, we take advantage of the fact that we can consider these functions as elements of C of the delta capital one. So we take uh, K sigma just as the points of the Cantor set where the norms are bigger than one minus epsilon. This epsilon was the one given, given by the lots Rosenthal theorem. And then we just take the intersection of the union of this k sigma. So this is just a finite union of compact sets. And then what we take, what we are taking is a decreasing uh, sequence of compact sets. So this is this has non-empty intersection. And here in this set, what happens is that each j sigma either has a big norm or a small norm. So in some sense. What we are doing is trying to disjunctify these functions J sigma. Okay. So now we consider this quotient Q1, and we pass from the counter set just to, to, to work inside this uh, compact subspace K. And well, so now instead of J sigma, we will consider the functions H sigma, which are just the images through Q1. These functions are not still disjoint, but the evaluations of these functions are almost disjoint in the sense of the norm. Now, what we are going to do is try to disjointify these families of functions, but let's say on the part of capital L1. So in the next step, what we do is something similar, but with the domains uh, corresponding to the part of capital L1. So for each S in K, we consider this set here, which is somehow like a, a subset of the unit interval where the, where the measure of HC sigma S is concentrated. So again, we take an intersection, well, an intersection of these sets. And finally, we define another operator, Q2, which essentially what does is just to to its S in K, it uh, sends F of S to, to, to the restriction of F of S to this set, L, L sub, sub S. Okay, now here we are no, we do not, we do not know whether we are still working with continuous functions, but this doesn't matter. And well, in this step, what we get are a new family of functions, let's say X sigma. So these are the images through Q2 of H sigma. And again, since we are always working with bounded linear operators, this X family X sigma also satisfies these conditions here. But still, this is not, they do not satisfy these conditions here, okay? They, they, don't, they are not pairwise disjoint when we look at the elements of the same level of the dyadic tree. But now the evaluations are almost disjoint in the sense of norm, and let's say almost disjoint in the sense of the order. So in the next step, what we are going to do is we are not going to, to pass to another quotient. What we are going to do is just to, to lay it to, to, to take a little perturbation of these elements here. So instead of working now with this axioma, what we define is another 
sequence y sigma also indexed in the dyadic tree, which is this perturbation of the family x sigma. So it is defined, defined recursively in this way. So we take the same root and then we try to perturbate its successor just in this way. And by doing this, now what we get are these joint, two disjoint elements, y sigma zero and y sigma one. Now they are disjoint and they satisfy that the sum of these two elements gives y sigma, which is what we want. And we can do this in such a way that this new family is semi-normalized. So as, as I said before, this family now is going to generate a subspace, which is indeed a sublattice because this this joiners, this, this joiners condition, and this sublattice is going to be isomorphic, lattice isomorphic to C of the Cantor set. So we still have to prove that this space is lattice isomorphic to a quotient of a sublattice of X. And well, this is more or less easy to prove, just taking instead of these functions F sigma that we consider at the first step, what we consider are a similar perturbation of this F sigma using the same formula. Okay. And once we consider the sublattice generated by this perturbation, the image of this sublattice gives this white hat. So, as, as I said before, once we have this, then what we are proving is that there is a sublattice of X having a quotient lattice isomorphic to. C of the Cantor set, and since C of the Cantor set, since C of the unit interval can be embedded into this quotient, it embeds into set and therefore into X. Okay, so this concludes the, the proof of the theorem. So this is the result that we have proved. And indeed, we were able to characterize all those separable Banach lattices which are this property with C0 and C of the unity interval. We were able to prove that a separable Banach lattice has this property if and only if it is lattice embeddable into C of the unity interval. So if and only if it is essentially a sub-lattice of C of the unity interval. And well, this is a, a simple consequence of the following theorem which says that an infinite dimensional sublattice of, of C of the unit interval is either lattice isomorphic to C0 or contains a sublattice isomorphic to C of the unit interval. This is proved by using the fact that a sublattice which is not lattice isomorphic to C0 cannot have order continuous norm, and then using Kakutani's representation of sublattices of C of the unit interval, which are no longer continuous. Okay. So once we have proved this theorem, it is quite easy to prove this theorem here. First of all, that one implies two, this is immediate because if X is separable, then it embeds as a subspace into C of the unit interval. And therefore, if it, is, if it has this property, then it must be also that is embeddable into uh, C of the unit interval. So let's say that the non-trivial part is to, to prove that, C, that two implies one, and well, this is quite easy to prove using this theorem and the, the main theorem that we have proved. Because if we have a sublattice of C of the unit interval, then if it is finite dimensional or if it is isomorphic to C0, then we do know that it has this property here that it satisfies one. But if not, then it contains a sublattice, a lattice isomorphic to C of the unit interval. And therefore, in this case, what do we have? Okay, if we try, if we have an embedding of X into a Banach lattice X and into a Banach lattice Y, then since C of the unit interval is embedded, linearly embedded into X, then by this, by the main result, it is lattice embedded into Y. But since X is lattice embedded into C of the unit interval, then X can be lattice embedded into this lattice Y. So this is more or less, let's say, some sandwich standard argument. And well, so one may think what happens with uh, non-separable Banach lattices. So 
The main remaining question is whether there are non separable banner lattices having this property. We do not know if there are such banner lattices. For example, C, C0 of omega 1 or C0 of a uh, uncountable set does not have this property. Uh, a banner lattice having this property must be must have the countable chain condition. So, well, if, if we have a non separable banner lattice X having this property, a similar argument shows that this lattice must be must must be lattice embedded into a CK space, or it must be an AM space. And well, probably the most natural candidate is the following one: is the the space of continuous function over the uh, generalized Hilbert cube. And well, for example, of course, this is a an AM space. And well, an unseparable banner lattice satisfying this for property must be also could be also be a lattice embedded into the free banner lattice generated by itself. And this space satisfies this property. G0 of an uncountable uh, set does not satisfy that property because free banner lattice of a banner space is always CCC. And well, the fact that this space is uh, can be lattice embedded into the free banner lattice generated by it. Is due, is due to the fact that it is projective in the sense that we have defined it before in the sense of the Bacter and Wickstead. And well, if we restrict ourselves to, to the to banner lattices, which are CK spaces, if we consider the question of uh, if this space can be lattice embedded into a CK space whenever it can be linearly embedded, then there are some partial results of Gregor Slavanek. And um, well, the fact that we have a linear embedding, uh, well, uh, that the fact that we have a lattice embedding is equivalent to having a positive embedding in this case. And well, due to some results of uh, Levanek, Heidel, Fremding, in this case, when we restrict ourselves to, to just CK spaces, there are some affirmative answers to this question, but just for uh, uncountable sets of some given cardinals, okay, not for every cardinal. There are some partial positive answers to this question, just in the CK setting. Nothing more? Okay, so thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gonzalo, for the nice uh, lecture. I think we have time for.